Some of us have never heard the sound of a trumpet or the sound of a horn, but it's the very horn that threw down the walls of Jericho. Historically proven that the people of Israel were going to take territory of the land that the Lord had promised them, and when they lifted up their horns prophetically by the commandments and the instruction of Yahweh, barriers fell, and from that day they had authority over the land but there's something more significant about this sound the bible declares that the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with a act with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of god with a shofar of god and the bible declares that the dead in christ will be snatched up and the bible declares as well that those who are alive in christ will be snatched up in the cloud and will go to meet the lord in the air I have a very powerful question that I would like you to ask yourself. When the trumpet sounds, would you be taken or would you remain? You see, it's one thing to be taken, it's another thing to remain. When you remain, it means you remain to face the judgment of God. And then having to go through the judgments of the Antichrist and many Antichrist activities that will be taking place worse than the pestilence that we have 2000 years ago when we're facing the pandemic and today in the name of jesus i come to give you good news with the sound of the shofar that for god so loved the world people of norwich that whosoever believes in god will not perish but have everlasting life there are dimensions to perishing there is also a dimension to life but the life that i bring is eternal life you might have a physical life and a good financial life, a good psychological life. Everything is intact and also probably have some kind of a good spiritual life because many of you probably practice yoga, Buddhism and Shintism. You've engaged negative things, positive things. You're able to call all kinds of spirits and they do your biddings. But there's something that you cannot get except you believe in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus 
not as a Jew, but Christ Jesus as a Messiah. Because he was half God, he was fully God and fully man. His semen of what impregnated Mary was not the semen of a man. And hence, that's what makes him the son of the living God. Because his DNA was fully God. Born of a virgin Mary. And by that sign, by that sign, we can find faith in the supernatural power of God. The Bible reveals that when man ate the apple, God begins to release a decree over the woman and said the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, the heads of the devil. And there will be enmity between the two. And today we come speaking of that very promised seed that will deliver humanity from sin. John the Baptist being a voice that cried in the wilderness goes around say i'm on that voice that voice that cried in the wilderness that prepares the coming of the great king jesus comes and he, the way has been path, has been parked by the revelation of the person of john the baptist and today in the name of jesus i come to speak about jesus christ nor any other person but jesus christ the messiah the one true god who many do not know you celebrate Christmas and Easter, but yet you do not know the essence or the very basis for which you celebrate your Easter and your Christmas. And you see, because we've all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we misunderstand the very things of God. But today, by the preaching of the gospel, not the preaching of the gospel of a temple, but the preaching of the gospel of a person whose name is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord that saves man from their sins you see laws could not save man from their sins you see we have many constitutional laws and legislation which is out there to deter us from committing crimes but you see these laws have not been able to drop down the crime rates people still commit crimes you see we have a justice system and the justice system has not done anything you see it might deter us from committing crime but the law has no power to transform the hearts of an individual and hence that is why when we follow religion which is tied to traditions to customs to laws many of our hearts have never changed we observe things like christmas we give gifts but they're not from the bottom of our hearts we give gifts because it's a tradition we give gifts not from our hearts we give it out of tradition we give it out because it's tied to a day and so because it's not tied to our hearts we're in the family, but yet we're divided. We're in one building, but yet we're divided. We're in one building, but yet there's unforgiveness and bitterness. But here I'm here to tell you about a man who yet was, you were yet a sinner. And you were blaspheming his name, rebelling his laws. Even before man was created, the Bible declares in Revelation 13, the blood that was shed before the very foundations of the world. Before there was anything that was seen, the blood of the lamb was shed. A comprehensive insurance was laid down to preserve humanity. Not just to preserve our lives so we could do what we like, but to preserve us so we can have a relationship, a fellowship, and a communion with the unseen God. With the one God, the God who is a spirit, the God who dwells in inapproachable life. Lord put his life down so that we can still communicate with us. But now mankind, the Bible declares that this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. That men love darkness rather than lights. We like to build monuments and centuries and buildings and mosques. So we do not have a relationship with the one true God. So we can live our own life and do evil. We all know that none of us is holy. None of us can be holy without the power invested in us. The Bible declares this in John, the first John, the verse 12. It says, as many as receive him, he gave them power to become sons of God. You see, there is this, our identity is not tied to the color of our skin or the color of our eyes. Our identity is tied to God. Our true identity is restored when we become sons of the living God. Have you not heard when God created man, he created them in his image and likeness image and likeness that will give us the power to have fellowship and communion with him you see the very beginning in the garden there was no laws on how we relate with god there was fellowship and communion 
But right now, there's no more fellowship and communion. We find our, com our communion and our fellowship tied to buildings, tied to things, tied to laws. And laws has not done anything to us, but it's but bondage. And today, I come not to bring laws by the person. I come introducing or reintroducing you to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world, the Savior of humanity, the Savior of mankind. Some probably will not believe in sin, but yet they believe that there is a higher, there's a true power. There's a higher one. Many, look, I don't know those terms, but there's a higher thing. There's something, there's something that is out there. God is more than a thing. He dwells out of the box. Science is in a particular dimension. That is a three dimension. Physics is tied to a dimension. But then God is not tied to our physics, to our science, to our psychology. It's not tied to many other things that we try to define God. If I try to define a God who cannot be seen with my naked eyes, and a God who dwells in inapproachable light, and a God who is a spirit, I must have spiritual language to define a spiritual God. And the best language we can use to describe the God who dwells in heaven, who dwells in inapproachable lights, who is a spirit, who is invisible, is to describe him by the, the revelation of Jesus. And that is why we look at Jesus to see the one true God who is invisible, who is a spirit, who dwells in an approachable life. A God who left his glory about and became a man. He comes down and he comes not to be served. Like many other politicians come into power that they may be served, that they may have money and increase their wealth and exploit the very people they're meant to serve. And so we have a kingdom. A higher kingdom than the united kingdom jesus goes around galilee and capanium and he says people of galilee people of capanium people of israel the kingdom of heaven is at hand prophecy is being fulfilled and he says repent you see that word repentance is very powerful because it's a pursuit for the one true god who is christ and a, de and, and a departure from sin you see our criminals or our crimes, our criminal system has a well determined for committing crimes, which means it has a level of making you depart from committing certain crimes. You see, repentance is stop sinning and follow Jesus. You see, you could be in the in other religious faith and they will tell you not to sin. And say, so if I came about say, do not sin, you say I'm a Buddhist, I stop smoking, I stop drinking, I stop killing, I stop cheating. But many of us are not following God. Everybody could be a good citizen by observing the law. We could do all of that, but our pursuit is not towards God. But one of the first and greatest commandments, Jesus speaks to a man who is of the law. And he said, what does the Bible say? He said, thou will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the first and great commandment. And even I, I faltered in that because I'm a man born of sin. David said, I was sharpened in iniquity, I was conceived in sin, and therefore, in sin, I carry an image, a DNA of sin that forces me to sin. You see, sin is not just what you do, it's who you are, and that is why, for all have sinned or have sinned, and therefore, we're falling short of the glory of God. And so the God who did not fall short from the glory of God, the Bible declares in 2 Corinthians, the verse 5, the verse 20, it said, He who knew no sin became sin for the people of Norwich, that they might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Not in a building, not in a synagogue, not in a temple, not in a church, but in Christ. You see, many are in church, in synagogues, in mosques, but they are not in Christ. And so having a name saying, I'm a Christian, doesn't do anything to you. You're professing Christian, but not one that is in Christ. Because in Christ, there's the offices of a king, a prophet, and a priest. You see, the priesthood is dead. Our kingship as royals. You see, God wants you to become son, so you could be partakers of his kingdom. You see, we can be citizens of the United Kingdom, but we can never be part of the royal family of this nation. 
But when God gives you his kingdom, he makes you a family. And it doesn't really matter about your color. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin or the color of your eyes. We could debate about the color of Yeshua HaMashiach. But the last time I checked, I realized his skin color did not raise him from the dead. His eye color did not raise him from the dead. The left of his head did not raise him from the dead. He said, that is why we're born of the spirit. We're not born of color, not born of the color of your eyes. But we are sons of God by the spirit. And that is what ties us together. Because when we die, our spirit leaves our body. And the very color skin gets in by worms. They will love it. Especially when you got tattoos in it. It will taste like ice cream. Today in the name of Jesus. I come preaching the gospel of Jesus. And not my own. I didn't come to give you flies on my chest. Come to church. Because church has done worse. than Has done, has done a lot of bondage. And led many people into the lake of fire. Because they've known the building. And they've not known God. The people who are in the building today can't hear God's voice. They don't even know how he speaks. And so when you tell them God speaks, they like they marvel. Because they don't have fellowship. They don't have a relationship. They don't have communion. When God and Adam were in the Garden of Eden, they had a fellowship and a relationship. The Bible says in the cool of the day, the voice of God walked in the garden. Seeking, where is Adam? Adam, where are you? Today, God is, is actually walking in this city and he's knocking at the door. Jesus said the other day in the book of Revelation, he said, I stand at the door and I knock. And he's not, he's not actually breaking doors, he's knocking. He's very decent, he's not forcing it. And today as I preach this gospel, I'm not forcing you to repentance. But I'm, I'm reminding you of the love of God that will touch your heart. Because some of us... There are people who love us, but we hate them. And we rejected the love that comes from the right place. And we demand love that comes from the wrong place. And because of that, we've been rejected, disappointed. We follow friends who don't love us. We follow people who don't care about us. We fed people who don't know us and don't want to have a relationship. And all they want is what you can give them. And that is why many of us are in religion, what I can get from Buddha. Where he can give me power, authority. And God tells me that I want power to serve humanity. I looked at him and I said, listen, Superman with all his power never had a relationship with the very people he said. But the same Jesus Christ, though he had power, he mingled with men. A woman who was filled with blood, who had an issue with blood, would touch him and be healed. We're talking about a God who wants to reconcile himself to us. Not a superhero that wants to show his power and his authority and be separated from us. And that is why I come not telling you about Superman. I come telling you about Jesus. Because he came and he ate. The disciple probably saw him pooing somewhere. They saw him pee. He became a baby. He cried like us. He felt our very infirmity. He felt what made us sin. And so he could be compassionate enough. He's more credible than any other religious figures that we have. And if you do believe in Muhammad or Buddha or Baha or Krishna, their blood cannot block out your transgressions. Their blood cannot give you redemption. Their blood cannot give you remission for your sins. Their blood cannot purge your conscience from dead works to serve the one true God and his son whom he has sent. The blood of Buddha and Krishna or maybe your chakra rocks. Their, their blood, the blood every rocks don't bleed. But the blood of any of these vices of this personality cannot reconcile you to God. Their blood cannot give you before favor before God. Their blood cannot give you forgiveness of sins. The blood of these many religious figures that we follow, who we've made monuments and we, we place their names on buildings and we worship and we honor them and we revere them more than the one true God who liveth forever. Their blood cannot save you. And so I seek a savior. You see, our nation is at the verge of a World War III. And the thing, when war starts, we'll be looking for the invisible. This is the day of salvation, where you can encounter the Lord Jesus. Today, I'm calling the people of Norwich 
repent and come to the Lord. Turn away from your own ways. You see, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Because Christianity is about a fellowship. If Jesus had a Twitter account, we'll be following him and retweeting what he has said. Our retweeting is us acting according to his pattern. And one of the tweets that he put out there in Matthew, he says, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son. Teach them to observe. Teach them. And today, I'm retweeting that. I come not tweeting my own desire, my own opinion, my own beliefs. Okay. Where are you from? Me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm from the kingdom of heaven. Assemble, okay. assemble in Africa. In Africa, in Africa. God, God it's a job. It's a home. It reminds us of the provision of the Lord. The lamp is also reminds us of Christ. Just as the cross reminds us of the crucifixion, this one reminds us of the provision of salvation.
Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is still in the business of revealing his love. John 3.16 is a scripture. It's a revelation of the eternal love of God, which is not tied to wanting things or having a relationship with things. But the love of God is the pathway to knowing the God who dwells in inapproachable life. When I read the text, John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he sent. It gets me excited. It's like someone who is waiting for a delivery and paid less money for it or didn't pay no money. It's like you wanted to buy something for Max and Spencer. And Max and Spencer makes a phone call and say, we're sending your delivery to your address. You will get excited. And so God calls us, John 3, 16. And say, I have loved you with an everlasting life. I'm going to send my son to redeem you. I'm going to send my son to restore sweet things in your life. I'm going to send my son to bring healing and deliverance. This is exciting because our nation and the nation are looking for peace. The UN can't give it. And we realize many treaties have gone in from generation to generation, but there is still war. But then 
John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world that he sent his son. God bless you. Hallelujah. He will send his son to bring peace, to bring reconciliation, to bring justification, to bring healing and deliverance. You see, there is a void in each of us and that void cannot be filled with drugs. It cannot be filled with money because money can buy, drugs can buy happiness. You might have a kind of a happiness for a little while, but you'll be back there. You'll be back smoking. You'll be back doing many of these recreational vices that give you temporal peace. But I hear, I'm here to speak of the love of God that came to give us eternal peace, eternal love, eternal healing, eternal deliverance. And everything I'm going to talk about is eternal, which means death has no power to cut short your peace, the love of God, the deliverance of God, the provision of God, death that many of us feared 2,000 years ago or two years ago where we were put on masks and we were observing what we call COVID mandates. It could not deter or stop the love of God. Even the sins that we did and we committed and my great grandparents committed could not stop God from demonstrating his love. You're re you rejecting God or cursing God or cursing me for preaching him will not stop God from loving knowledge. No. Because something has gone before us. Even before we were born, even before humanity was formed or created, something had already gone before us. The love of God had already gone before us. The Bible declares that God is love. And so where there is no God, there is no true love because your love is tied to conditions but God's love is unconditional it's unconditional based on these on these parameters on a relationship and a communion the Bible says that he knows the number of our head and when I began to read that, I was saying God David began to realize that what is man oh God that you visit him every morning the visitation of God is Him giving you breath and breathing and having not to pay for air. Many are in hospitals right now and they're paying for oxygen that is free. But today you have your faculties or your, your system working, your respiratory system working perfectly, your circulatory system working perfectly. Your digestive system is working perfectly because of God's grace. And if God was evil today, many I say, if God is so good, what do bad things happen to bad people? A bad guy like me, with a God that is supposed to pay back, should have killed me the very moment I did certain things. But many of us are alive today because of God's love and His grace. And today I come to give you a relationship and not a law. I come not to come with a religion, but a fellowship with him. I'm here to announce to Norwich that God wants to restore that relationship that he has with you. And today, the way you will come to him is by denying yourself. You see, for all have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible reveals the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so through him, we can get eternal life. We do not find eternal life in buildings, in mosques, in sanctuaries, in, in, in Sikh temples, or in rocks, in, in, in Buddha practicing or yoga practicing. We cannot find eternal life in that. You will find positivity and good vibes in that. But when it comes to eternal life, you won't find it in sciences. You won't find it in Darwinism. You won't find it in evolutionism. You won't find it in being an atheist. In being an atheist, you won't find eternal life. You will find a life in hating God and everything that is tied to knowing God. You will have a hatred against the unseen spirit, the one who dwells in unapproachable life. You will be a hater and not a lover of the very creator that created you. And today in the name of Jesus, 
we come to tell you about the love of God. The Lord Jesus Christ. The one who died for your sins. The one who knew no sin but he came sin for us. That you and I will be the righteousness of God in Christ. You see our righteousness before the unseen God. The one true God. The one who dwells in any approachable life. Who is a spirit. Who made himself manifest through his son Jesus Christ. Can only approve our good works if we are in Christ. He sees our righteousness as filthy rags. And that is why many will end up being in the lake of fire. Though they gave to the poor. Fed those who were hungry. Gave shelter to those who were homeless. Respected all religions. And showed a kind of love. Will find themselves in the lake of fire. Because their works were as, as filthy rags. You see, you can't buy your way into heaven. We get ourselves into heaven by being in Him, hiding in Christ, wearing the form of Christ, hiding in Him, and Him in us. We find ourselves in His presence, in the presence of the very one true God. That is where we find ourselves going to heaven. We will not find ourselves in heaven because of what we did. We'll find ourselves in heaven because of whom we have believed and what whom we have believed has done for us. What Christ, I only make my boast in him because it's what he has done in me that has made me look like what I look in the outward. My deliverance is as a result of the finished work of God on the cross taking place in me, finishing me into his image and likeness. So we can't not do anything to buy our way in. The Bible says, cast in the man who puts his trust in man or in the arm of flesh. In the arm of flesh, we created sciences that has only been convenient, temporary. It has dealt with things for a limited amount of time and very soon we will need an upgrade. But in Christ, there is no upgrade. It's eternally safe. We found peace in him. You see, we can have all the weapons. And those weapons will become a cave. What will happen to all the weapons of this nation? They will all be outdated. And be thrown into the deepest ocean. Because now they're useless. But see, when you have Jesus in your life. He can never become outdated. Because he's the ancient one. Ever true. Whose rock we can cleave in and hide in. Yes. He's the ancient one that though he's old. He's still the same yesterday, today and forever. Yes. Our God never changed. No. Your ideas, your inventions, your innovations will be old. But the one who I preach, the Lord Jesus. His blood is still flowing today. And wants to make atonement or is making atonement for souls. His blood is actually swelling the, and pacifying the wrath of the Father. The Bible reveals in Peter, it said, God is not slack as many count him to be slack, but God is long suffering because of the blood. He's forbearing because of the blood. His desire, because of the blood that was shed for you and I, his desire is that we will not perish, but we will all repent. That is his design. This repentance is to restore that relationship. You see, when we repent, is that we'll have a fellowship or a friendship with God. You see, when we repent, we begin to have membership with a church. Our repentance is like to a church membership, a mosque membership, a, 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 some kind of networks. But you see, your membership in church or your membership card of a church or a century or a synagogue or a mosque. On that day when you stand before the one true God, you show him your membership. He or he will ask you, did you believe in my son? Did you believe in the cross? And you say, I was a church member, I gave to the poor. These days, our churches have more become outward. Lip service, men pleasing, and, and, and eye service. We no longer serve the one true God. We fear men rather than God. We fear our leaders rather than one true God. 
I like what Jesus said. Very, very say I say unto you. Do not fear him that can destroy your body, but can destroy your soul. You see, that is why you can get all the things in this world and all the money and all the weapons. Like Putin. But yet, your life one day, your soul will stand before God. And with all his weapon and his power and how men fear him and they fear him because he's going to release a bomb against this nation we fear him but one day he will stand before god and the very people who are in christ will be judging people like putin because paul speaks to the people of god in corinthians he said do you not know that you will judge angels and if putin is not an angel then i'll be judging angels for violating the laws of god what do you think we'll be doing to people like putin but yet we, we because we fear men we do not know the power of what god has invested in those that love him and those who are giving his life to him in eternity and today i'm here to remind you of your identity in god not of your identity tied to a church not your identity tied to a mosque no, your identity tied to a synagogue. No identity tied to your color of your skin or the color of your eyes. No, your identity of what you have achieved in life. Because life is not what you have possessed or the qualification that you have. But life is tied to knowing the one true God and his son whom he has sent. And many are lacking that knowledge. And therefore, for lack of knowledge, people perish. You see, truth is a person. That is why many have read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They read the text and they missed the person of the text. They means they missed the spirit of the author of the text. And if you read texts, you will miss God. When you read texts from a mind of a science, from a scientific mindset or a psychological mindset, or whatever profession you do you will miss the god who is a spirit because the text reveals is a revelation of the one true god who is a spirit who dwells in inapproachable light that you can't see with your naked eyes even with your science methods and your science uh, experiment parameters you won't be able to see him and that is why i try to experiment creation to discover god you will not find him you only find him by the eye of faith by the eye of faith because now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen the bible declares what faith is faith is a person and that person is jesus and that is our righteousness is of jesus christ our faith is of jesus christ our righteousness is of jesus christ eternal life is of jesus christ Hallelujah. it's not of a person of a nationality and here i want to tell you something the woman of the world did not have an encounter with god because jesus was a jew not because he predicted her life to her but she had an messianic encounter or messianic encounter she goes to the marketplace and said i've met a man who told me about my life the messiah and so many who are moses who believe jesus was just a prophet he was more than that he was the messiah and when you read your surah the text surah the fourth the 45th verse to the 49th verse it reveals jesus the messiah I've read the text. I have a Quran in my back. Come and we will have a conversation. And I'm here to announce to you that Jesus is not just a prophet. And will not only stay a prophet. But he is the savior of humanity. John the Baptist, the prophet. Say the love of God that taken away the sins of the world. The love of God that restores relationship with God and man. The love of God that is the mediator between man and God. You see, Mary was not the love of God as many say Hail Marys. Because your Hail Marys cannot save you. It might fuel your ego because you feel guilty and with sin. And so you need another intermediary that will stand in between you and Jesus. For Jesus to stand you and the Father. But have you not heard? That the very veil that separated the children of Israel from the holies of holies 
was torn into pieces when the blood of Jesus hit the ground. The Bible declares that when the blood was shed, the graves were opened. The temple veil that separated people that needed a chief priest to go into the holies of holies to make atonement and to bless, release the blessing of God over the people of Israel. That day that veil was torn. That means anyone who believes in Jesus, in his person and the works of Jesus could come to the Father. That is why whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, people of Norwich, the name of the Lord Jesus, the Yeshua HaMashiach, will be saved. Will get an audience with God. Who will get access into his presence. Who will be able to go to the throne room, to the holies of holies, in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, and hear God and have communion with him. And today, in the name of Jesus, I blow this shofar to lift up every religious barrier and to tell you that through Jesus, you can have fellowship with him. Through Jesus, when you have repented and denied yourself and you have picked up your cross, you can have fellowship with the one true God who revealed himself in the flesh. And today, as I come to a close, there is the A, B, C, D to salvation. When you do not fulfill these A, B, C, D, you will not find salvation. And hence, the salvation is tied to everlasting life. If you're looking for a religious life, go ahead and go and look for a church and go there. If you're looking for a religious life, go ahead and look for that. But if you want everlasting life, that when you die today, you'll be with God forever. It's not about just being in a heavenly place. It's about being with God. The reason why we want everlasting life is that we want to spend eternity with God, having fellowship, having communion together. And I'm here to give you that key, the ABC. The A is that you admit you're a sinner because for all our sin and falling short of the glory. And the wages of sin is death. Death is a separation. Death is a separation. Physical death is a separation of the soul and the body. Spiritual death is a separation of a man who is still in the body, but yet disconnected from God, separated from God. There is also a psychological death. You could be in your body and your brains don't work. You're dead, you're a cabbage. And that is why you need life. Life restores, it, it removes death. It removes every separation and brings you closer to the one true God. So A is that you admit you're a sinner. And you need a savior you admit you're a sinner is not you do not need a church or a mosque or a synagogue you do not need yoga practices or rocks you need a savior you need a person you do not need laws you need a person and that person who will redeem you when you've admitted you're a sinner that person is jesus christ of nazareth b is that you believe because many have admitted that they're sinners but they do not believe in Jesus. They admitted we are sinners. We've all gone wrong. You know what? I still smoke. But they don't have faith in Jesus. Your faith is what will bring that deliverance. And the B is that you believe in Jesus. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. If you want eternal life, then there's only one way to eternal life. If you want any kind of life, then there are many ways to other lives. That is why there are many ways to eat, uh, uh, what is it? a financial life. I can kill as many people as I want. And give it to the devil and he will give me all the riches. I will get good financial life. If I want lives and want to go into Hollywood. And you, if you're a woman. You just have to be beautiful. Open up your life and you will get a Hollywood life. But if it comes to eternal life. That I preach. Then there's only one way. I don't care if you tell me there are many ways to eternal life. You're a liar. And the word of God is not in you. The truth of God is not in you. You are calling Jesus a liar and God a liar. But if God be the truth, then you will seek him. And therefore you believe that he's the only one that can give me eternal life. And that there's only one way. If you want an Islamic life, then go ahead, go to the mosque. Because here I'm not giving you an Islamic life or a Hindu life. I came to speak about eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is why there's only one way to that eternal life. Not in the church, you won't find it. Many are in the temples and they're hypocrites and pedophiles. And so if you want eternal life, you go believe in the one true God and his son whom he has sent, Jesus. 
The seed to salvation is that you confess your sins. There are many who are Catholic, they are confessing. There are many who are in a, in a monks or in Nepal somewhere, they are confessing their sins. But the thing is, who are you confessing your sin to if you want eternal life? You're confessing your sin that you will have eternal life. And there's only one person you need to confess to. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth and Yeshua HaMashiach. You need to go to him and confess your sin. Many go to priests and popes and they get the kids, the hand of the pope by a kiss. They think that will blot out the transgressions and the sins and the iniquities. You will not find him kissing the pope or kissing his feet. You will find him in confessing your sins. And so the C, the A is that you admit you need a sin and you are sin. The B is that you believe in Jesus Christ of Nazareth because you are a sinner and you need salvation. The C is that you confess your sins. And then let me tell you good news. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. I don't care if you're Putin and you've killed many people. By the very moment Putin will confess his sin to Almighty God and seek everlasting life from Jesus Christ, his sins will be forgiven. Even though he's bombed Ukraine, if you will confess his sins, he will be forgiven. Because the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your righteousness. I was a sinner. The reason why Jesus came was to save sinners and whom I was a chief sinner. I was a chief sinner. And today he's still doing a work in me. Because you see salvation is not a one day thing or a prayer that you say. Salvation is a work, a continuous work until the day you die. God will sculpture you until you look like him. It's going to be very painful because you'll be redrawn from the things you like. And God, close, and, and God will draw you closer to the things that he likes. And so your dislikes will become the dislikes of God. What you, what you like or what God likes is what you will have to like. And what God hates is what you begin to hate. And so when you confess your sins, then you begin to have everlasting life. And the D is denial and decisions. You see, it's just like a man and a woman who have met. They've admitted that they love each other. They believe that they're in love. They've confessed they're in love, but they're not willing to get married. They've not decided to tie the knot. And you see, there are many of us like that. We've used, we've made a religious decision. You see, religion has no covenant attached to it. That is why many are church goers and find themselves in the lake of fire. And that is why I'm saying there's a place you come to experience the true eternal life of God. It comes by denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following Jesus. And many of us are probably are in that place right now. We confess our sins every day. We say, Lord God, help me. Deliver me. When our relatives are dying, we say, Lord, I promise I'll never sin again. I've been there before. I promise I'll never do evil. You know, I'm evil. Help me. If you will get my grandmother or my mom out of the hospital bed, I will never be that man again. But you see, we'll make these confessions. We'll have that belief that God will raise them when we say the prayer. And we have admitted that we're evil, but we have not decided that when he raised our prayers from their sickness or take them out of the bed of affliction, we will never make that decision that we will follow him. We'll never make that decision. But today, the A, B, C, D of salvation, the last one, the D, is that you will decide to follow him. You will decide to retweet his tweets. You will decide that you will follow him and believe everything that he says. And today, this is the A, B, C, that you admit you will believe in Jesus, you confess your sins to Jesus, you will decide to follow Jesus, and then you will have everlasting life or eternal life. Or else you will likewise perish in your moxes, in your churches, in your Hindu praying self. You will find yourself perishing, the perishing soul of the Lord God Almighty. And your religion won't be able to save you. Because religion hasn't changed the nation. It's actually made them, people who knew God, become haters of God. They were once missionaries by religion. Now has not made them missionaries today. 
The very people they send the gospel to are now sending the gospel back to them. So religion didn't save this nation. If they still had a relationship covenant with the law, they would still be sending missionaries out. And they would still not be haters of God and become Darwinists and evolutionists and atheists as they are today. They won't be saying that there is no God. Because they did not have a relationship with God. They had a religion. And the religion was starting to color of their eyes and their skin. And God wants to redeem you from that. God is saying, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Some find their faith in their sex change. That because of how they feel, they were a man but now they are a woman. You see, your sex change doesn't give you life. Because you see, what will it profit you if you have a sex change and you still lose your soul? You see, you can't change the gender of your soul, but you can change the gender of your body. Because your soul is not tied to a gender. There's no male or female in heaven. There's spirits. And our bodies are not physical bodies, but celestial bodies. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent from your abortions. Because the fact that it's right to kill babies is not right. Haven't you heard that when God was speaking to Jeremiah, he said, even before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. The very moment a child is formed in the womb, God knows that child. Even though it's not formed and it looks like a frog or a tadpole, it has destiny attached to it. And the moment we abort a child, we've not just aborted a physical egg, but we have aborted a destiny that will come and change humanity and save humanity. And today God is calling us to repent. 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 Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is not going to come like a baby crying in a manger. He's going to come as a king on a white horse. And judge the unrighteous. And those who did not believe in him will be cast into the lake of fire. But today if you believe in him, your life will be changed. And as I come to a close with the blast of the shofar is that I will release that sound of repentance and it will pierce your heart. Some will put their hands in their ears, but this is a prophetic sound because it goes right down to your spirit and your innermost being that you were once with a place that had this sound in heaven. And you're just here assembled on earth for a purpose to serve God and allow God to express himself in your body to serve humanity who are falling from grace and are falling from the glory of Almighty God. And so therefore, Norwich, as I come to a close with a blast on the sofa, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. repent because jesus is coming again repent repent and come to christ so that you'll be insulated from the crisis that is about to come god bless you and have a blessed day hallelujah
Aliens are so anyone trying to stop me in the dream from today. You no know, longer be able to do that. Father, your presence through the room. Which is in the name of Jesus. Father, we come against every poison in the world. We command that poison to come out now. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will give us spirit, soul, and water in the name of Jesus. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will preserve the spirit, soul, and water for the coming of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, saints. Amen. God bless you, man. I'm just off. So I'm moving to the next city. Keep on praying for me that God will have his will. And his will will be done in Norwich and in Ipswich. As I go there, let the heavens be open. God bless you and have a blessed, blessed day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.